Mr. Allen. Yep. Uh, I would. I am right now in my college. I would like to share with the screen. We have some difficulties in picking the tops. We are Israel Island. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So right now we have made a 2D line from the 3D cube, uh, crossing all the tops, uh, crossing all the wells that has both tops and the check shots. So here we. Have those are the only two wells that have the same reflector and uh, the same fossil on the same reflector. Like if we go here, this isn't present, but uh, no, the other direction, like here, the reflector dips and there isn't any influence of the tectonics. Like I know there is a rapid deposition in, uh, in the Asian island. But how should I continue picking this top? Like, as you see here, the top is continuous. And then this well says it's down here. So, you know, so welcome to the real world. And so there are man, many factors that can influence this. So again, you go for Mexico teams. This is probably the, the worst situation because your rate of sedimentation is so rapid. That's, and that's the reason we go to these bugs. We don't talk Jurassic or we don't talk whatever, Middle Miocene, et cetera. We talk about these bug names. That's the best resolution we can get. But every piece of data is imperfect. So let's go over it again. So remember these tops, trim A, you know, whatever, those are provided by each oil company to the government. And yes. they're pro provided after someone sits in a microscope, just like Mr. Chris does sometimes. He looks at thin sections. Other people look at bugs. And they look at a little fragment of a shell. And they tell you, oh, th there's a piece of trim A, right? right. And then the geologist at Chevron uh, will say, sees that exact little fragment, says, oh, that's not trim A. That's something else. So first of all, you have to remember that these tops are not absolute truth, OK? So it is what different people uh, interpreted in different oil companies. There is no homogenization of those. Second thing, your time depth conversions may be slightly different. There may be a slight error in, in one time depth conversion relative to another. So the trim A on the right might actually need to post a little bit higher or lower. Uh, that's the second thing. And then the How third thing- I check that, if you please? We do not have any sonic logs. We uh, gave, only well, we have- gave you, We gave you check shots. Right. And so look, did you overlay all the check shots in one uh, Excel file? Yes. Okay, well, do they all fall on the same curve or do they have variations? That's the first thing. And I'm just saying- There are a lot possible. of variations. Sorry, there are? Uh, a lot of variations between- them. Okay, so I need to see. So if I see nine out of 10 wells plot on, you know, within a narrow range and I see the 10th well plot way off and my trim A is way off, I'm going to say, ah, better go double check that check shot. What, where would that top post if I borrowed, and you can do this in the workstations, borrowed a check shot from another well. Every workstation allows you to borrow check shots. So every well can have a borrowed time depth function. So anyway, all I'm saying is this is a real uh, world challenge. And so the other thing, of course, is a fault, right? And so you have to go back and double check. So pick an arb line, avoiding the faults. If you are really sure that you have not crossed a fault, then I'm going to say, and if you believe, say, the uh, time depth functions are good, I'm going to say, well, then you know what? The Chevron geologist is just picking differently from the Exxon geologist. I cannot fix that, right? All you can do is say, okay, I see an event. I believe this event because I can follow it. And because I have a trim A top a little bit above it here and a little trim A top a little bit below it, I'm going to call my event, my blue event, trim A plus or minus. What so I that, wanted to real world added. solution, it's not perfect, yeah. Yeah, so, so Alan, I want to some, add something because I was lucky enough when I worked in Gulf of Mexico to sit closely to paleontologists. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of different uncertainties. So those, you know, tops are never certain. In this situation you have here in the seismic line, what overrides the position of this trimosina top is actually your seismic peak. 
and if nine wells penetrate the stop where the, your blue marker is, this one you're just going to disregard. And there are problems with picking the assemblages. Remember, they're coming from cuttings that are collected every 30 feet. And sometimes the people who pick those fossils, micro fossils, may be better trained or trained to lower. Paleontologists then have to interpret the data, find the last occurrence of specific fossils or specific assemblages. So this is a good, good kind of starting point, but at some point your synthetics and your seismic are going to be, I don't want to say more, more important, but waiting more information. So, you know, this is just a piece of information with its own uncertainties. It's not like a Bible or whatever. So again, integrate with seismic. If you have a good event that's consistent over the area, you can go around the salt, around the fault ramps. That, that's your framework. So don't agonize over that, but try to work around and maybe read something about it, about uncertainty, how actually this top is done, because this is just the top of the iceberg. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainties below the waterline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but certainly that trim A, you're showing that piece right there. That actually is very good. You know, you're showing trim A and blue, trim A on blue. Uh, the, the, you know, in those two cases, it's working very nicely. And I would recommend what Mr. Chris just said. First and foremost, you tie your wells, but also avoid the salt domes. And if you can, avoid the faults. That's where it's going to be the easiest way to check these tops. We did avoid the faults, but we couldn't find any arbitrary line crossing the salts. So yeah. we must cross the salt. Yeah, OK, that's fine. We'll try and find cross it where it's as little uplift as possible, the best you can do. Other than that, it's a least squares fit solution is the way I always call it. Interpretation, it's not going to fall on a straight line. The petrophysicists work, the geologists work, etc. You're plotting, you're getting all these views of the subsurface. They're scattered. And as a team, you're coming up with what I call a least squares fit to all the imperfect data. That's, that's what it's really about. Remember, just because it's not digital doesn't mean it's not information, right? So, it, so Yes, but we cannot integrate it in the... Uh, or we will take some time to integrate it into our workstation. That's correct. But you can read a delta T value in 10 seconds and say the average velocity from here to here is this delta T, you know, one over this delta T. Yes. And in 10 seconds, you can know a, a, an approximate interval velocity for interval. So again, never turn down and never limit yourself to a particular type of information such as digital. So that's the general comment. Now, if nothing else, a couple of things we'll look into. A, if we can find, let's say you have no sonic logs. If we can find some sonic logs around, we can use those to make a general time depth curve, right? Uh, and, and, and that's the other thing that, you know, these time depth functions, those are velocity information too, as has been said before. You can convert those to interval velocity also. Um, and then the other thing is that remember in these workstations, you can do things such as the Faust equation, right? You can convert resistivity to sonic log. It's not perfect by any means, but it is something, right? So, you, you, so to make a synthetic, you could do that. Well, Alan, this is actually a very good comment. Um, in classic system, my experience is that the uh, resistivity log follows your sonic log in Shaley intervals. So if you find, find resistivity jumps or interfaces in a Shelley intervals and can connect it seismic event, you can infer actually what the sonic is going to look like. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, and then there's also Gardner's equation, which relates density and velocity. So, I mean, you have to be careful that, you, you know, I'm going to call these synthetic logs, right? Gar uh, Faust is a synthetic log, but it can work in certain cases. Gardner creates a synthetic log. So, of course, you have to QC it very carefully, but there's always ways to, to work around. So let's take it one step at a time. We'll double check just to make sure we see uh, what we gave you on those images. Uh, we try and give sonic logs to, you know, find sonic logs in every area if we possibly can. So we'll, we'll double check. If not, we'll keep working with you. But Petrel will have Faust, Petrel will have Gardner's. 
So there will always be ways to calculate an approximate, um, you know. Well, thank you for answering my question, Mr. Allen. Okay, no, no problem. Uh, Mr. Allen, I have a question. Uh, it, well, you mentioned something about the TD function that sometimes there are some difference between the TD functions and different worlds. And you mentioned something that we can do, uh, but I, 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 I couldn't hear that. Can you repeat it? Well, uh, we aren't yet on the TD, but I think that it, it, it is really important to know. It's actually quite, quite involved, especially if you're on shore, because like you say, if you're in the Permian Basin, you know, one company like Schlumberger will process their seismic at a datum of, we'll say, 2,000 feet and 8,000 feet per second datum velocity. Again, you need to go to the Wikipedia. Another company will uh, do their processing differently. So you've got one factor here. Ultimately, you want to get this into the seismic, right? So there is a factor there. And then, you know, you've got the elevation of the well. So again, in the Permian Basin, the elevation, the Kelly bushing could be 500 feet different at one location. So if I'm doing a time depth function from here, I've, I've got to take that into account. One way, actually, I didn't mention this, but one way you could do it, if you had two time depth functions, right, or, or sonic logs, which you've converted to velocity, you could po post the tops on each, right? So you could say, here is the top, of formation A in this well, here's the top of formation A in that well, and actually start to measure your interval velocities from that point. That's actually in some ways one of the simplest techniques. Um, but, you know, we'll have to talk in more detail about it, but bottom line is again, your, your, your delta T is one over velocity. Um, and so, and then once, for example, that's in Excel, I, I can in Excel, Take the average from this point to this point, this depth to that depth, or that top to that top. Ultimately, you do want to understand velocity in terms of the layers, the tops. So it's not a, not a complete answer, maybe. If you want, we can have a separate work session or something next week. Thank you, Mr. Earl. Yeah, I get it. Thank you. So I think if there's nothing else, we'll, uh, we'll call it quits for today. And... Uh, Okay, thanks Thank everybody. You.